Welcome back. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Metz, who is chair of the Department of Epidemiology at the School of Public Health and offering up our public health response. Dr. Metz. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Don Williamson, who's the, the state health officer in Alabama. Uh, Dr. Williamson is a Mississippi native. He received his undergraduate degree at uh, Mississippi State, a medical degree from the University of Mississippi. And he has spent his entire career in public health. He, he began as a tuberculosis control officer in Mississippi and moved to Alabama where he directed programs in disease control and preventive health services. He became the health officer in uh, 1992. And since then, he, among all of his activities, he has been a very proactive in, in supporting collaborative relationships uh, between the State Health Department and the uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham, particularly the School of Public Health. And for this, we're very grateful. Most recent uh, of these has been the the bioterrorism response initiative funded by CDC. Um, without further delay, Dr. Williamson. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it is a privilege to be here uh, this afternoon. What uh, what I'd like to do, and, and then I'll introduce Dr. Warnley at the end, is simply in my brief presentation to sort of lay a, a bit of a, a groundwork and a framework for public health, uh, bioterrorism, and why uh, this is of, of import. Uh, let's see if I can make this thing work. I think perhaps the, the best reason to, think, to focus from a public health perspective on bioterrorism is that in many ways it is the frank antithesis of everything that we in public health believe. If you look at the mission statement of the Alabama Department of Public Health, we espouse as a goal to assure conditions in which the people of Alabama can be healthy. CDC has very correctly defined bioterrorism as the intentional or threatened use of viruses, bacteria, fungi, or toxins from living organisms to produce death or disease in humans, animals, or plants. And if as a public health entity our goal is to ensure conditions in which people can live healthy, then efforts which would deliberately cause disease are among the most onerous and noxious that we would face. Perhaps no one said it better than Joshua Letterberg, who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1958, when he said that biological weapons represent the absolute perversion of medical science. Now, obviously, bioterrorism can be, can be catastrophic. We in public health deal with catastrophes. Uh, we, we deal with floods. We deal with hurricanes. Obviously, Jefferson County area dealt, dealt with a massive tornado uh, just a few years ago. But to a certain extent, those are defined events in time and in space, and you can recognize their occurrence. Perhaps bioterrorism is even potentially more catastrophic and I think in many ways more frightening because of the last issue. It may be extraordinarily difficult to diagnose and treat. It is also frightening for the same reason that early in the AIDS epidemic there was such fear around HIV and AIDS. There was a fear of aerosol transmission, a fear of mass exposure. Fortunately with HIV that became not an issue. But without question, as you've heard today, many of these agents can be aerosolized. Many of them are stable. We know, for example, that anthrax spores are stable for over 40 years in the environment. We know that not only anthrax, but brucellosis, plague, Q fever, tularemia, smallpox, viral encephalitides, hemorrhagic fever, botulism, toxin, and staph enterotoxin B all are aerosolized and infected. 
we have a, a hugely susceptible civilian population. Even for the one agent smallpox for which a number of us in here have been vaccinated, the odds are very great that all of us in here are now susceptible again. There is obviously high morbidity and mortality ranging from perhaps 40% in smallpox to well over 70 and 80% for some of the other agents. Contagion and human person-to-person -person transmission is obviously a concern for many of these agents. Smallpox, plague, and viral hemorrhagic fever are just a couple of examples of agents for which person-to-person -person transmission would be a, a real problem. Well, why respond now? Why is, is this an issue now? Well, I think obviously one of the reasons it's an issue now is because of the press that has been received for the efforts in Tokyo, for now the salad bar incident in Oregon. But also I think it is a growing recognition that in our post-Cold War world that some of the the assumptions and some of the relationships which were in place before that served as counterweights to, to inappropriate behavior are gone. The Gulf War of 91 uh, led us to suddenly d realize we in many cases may be dealing with rogue, not only rogue states, but also uh, as we've seen with some, our, some of our own domestic terrorism, uh, rogue individuals. So I think the threat is clearly real. The agents are available. Delivery is certainly poss possible. Perpetrators are around. And as we've all seen today, instances of bioterrorism have occurred. Now, being a good bureaucrat, it is also important to understand that there's a funding stream. The fact that the federal government is now interested in this and provides leadership and dollars become important. And I, and I want to say why I think that is, in fact, so important. For a lot of us, for, for me as well as most of my counterparts in public health around the country, the concept of bioterrorism is not something that we wake up every morning thinking about. And it's not, frankly, the same sort of anxiety producing event as a nuclear explosion. But there is something in many ways more comforting about a nuclear explosion. You won't have to wonder if it happened. You will know it happened. However, the one thing about bioterrorism that does cause all health officials enormous concern is that bioterrorism will have to be detected unless the perpetrator wants public attention and goes public to announce what they've done, will have to be detected through the surveillance systems that detect every other communicable disease. And all of us in public health have our stories about 5 o'clock on Friday afternoon and weird things showing up in the ER and it may be being two to three days before somebody figure out, figures out what happens. And so to a certain extent, the opportunity that, with that federal leadership and federal dollars provide in strengthening the basic public health infrastructure, in strengthening the surveillance system, Yes, that hopefully will help us better identify smallpox if it occurs. But frankly, I hope it will also better help us identify an outbreak of salmonella, not because somebody spiked the salad bar, but because somebody chopped the chicken and the salad on the same location. That will be a win for all of us in, in health care. Obviously, public health has to be integrally involved in this control effort. There is obviously a congressional mandate for public health involvement. We in public health on a routine basis do outbreaks of inve uh, do investigations of outbreaks. An outbreak of a salad bar associated with multiple cases of foodborne illness, not uncommon. An, out uh, an investigation uh, of health care wor of a uh, uh, worker who had hepatitis A and potentially transmitted in a food establishment. Those are things we do just as a matter of course. We have the staff who can look at the occurrence of disease and not only look at what has occurred, but also try to analyze patterns of occurrence, common exposures, 
common potential sites of acquisition. Again, thanks to some funding from CDC, many public health laboratories around the country are now looking at more rapid and specialized laboratory testing. While we, for example, as, as everybody learned last night, in Alabama have no level four labs, have no place where you could get an overnight EM done for smallpox. There are a number of other things that the only people who do them are public health labs. And the only place you're gonna get a, 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 a test done for rabies is gonna be in a public health laboratory. Uh, pretty much, for example, the only place you're gonna get some fairly specialized identification of microorganisms done is in the state public health laboratory. So we've got some infrastructure to do some of the potential agents of, of, uh, of, of importance. We do bring multidisciplinary expertise. Everything from sanitarians and environmentalists on one side to nurses and social workers to help deal with the psychosocial consequences of the illness on the other, as well as physicians and other providers. We deal on a regular basis with trying to disseminate information to the public and to the media. Uh, and, and as you have heard, we believe that will be one of the most critical and important components of any bioterrorist terrorism response plan. And then we have a lot of experience of coordinating and working with other agencies, both at the state level as well as the federal level. So we look forward to playing a pivotal role should this ever become necessary. Now, obviously, our goal would be to prevent the occurrence of a bioterrorist event, to help prevent it by being able, by letting everybody know we are prepared, and hopefully that will serve as some deterrent. But our second goal is to minimize casualties in the event that a, an event occurred. The most important component to minimizing casualties will be rapid detection and rapid diagnosis. That's why ensuring the surveillance system works and works well is so very, very important. One of the issues that, that will obviously be important is in helping to ensure that people who respond to bioterrorist events are also protected. Whether those are EMS personnel, whether those are people in the hospital, wherever those responders are, Public health has statutory authorities to, authority to ensure that people who have been exposed or may have been exposed to various communicable diseases and other conditions of public health importance can be managed uh, and addressed. Obviously, optimal and timely treatment of the exposed, whether that's tuberculosis in a school, whether that's in meningitis, meningitis, those are things public health has historically done, and it's something that we are probably uniquely situated to do. The distribution of credible, timely, and appropriate advice. One of the things that I think we have learned in the discussions of bioterrorism are that it's very unlikely that one entity is going to have all the answers. And that's why the partnership between the state agencies, the federal government, the FBI, CDC, HHS, that entire spectrum is going to be so very important to try to get at what are the right answers. As we talked last night, <clears throat> if we had a smallpox outbreak, the problem is very unlikely to be getting people to agree to take the vaccine. The problem is going to be trying to balance the desire of the people where the, the outbreak occurs to have universal vaccination with the finite number of doses of vaccine that are available for the entire country and the realization that if it occurs, that sort of agent is likely gonna be spread and once it's spread, it's gonna be a, a much bigger issue than just one community. So that sort of weighing of risk and benefit is gonna be extraordinarily important. And then again, we would hope that through this, what comes out is a harmonious and cohesive me message that inspires confidence on the part of the citizens who are hearing the message. Now, in Alabama, the question is, do we really have any target sites? I, mean, I must admit, the first time that somebody said, Don, there's a bioterrorism bioterror grant, after, you know, chuckling a little bit, uh, it was pointed out to me, you know, that's nice, but remember, the, there was the Olympics in Birmingham, 
and there are sites in Alabama that are potential targets. Uh, the non lugerin Dominici bill identified the four major urban areas in the state, Birmingham, Mobile, Huntsville, and Montgomery. Also, we, need, we would want to think about Anniston Army Depot. We have two nuclear power plants in the state, one in the, near Decatur, one near Dothan. So there are sites potentially in Alabama that if uh, someone wanted to uh, create problems, they would certainly have that opportunity. Now, getting to the real bureaucratic answer here, the money, CDC made available $41 million to public health agencies around the nation. And there were five, as you heard, five categories of potential funding. Alabama submitted a proposal for four of the five. We were one of only uh, eight states to receive funding in four or five categories. We received funding for preparedness, about $150,000, and that we're working with UAB on the development of that preparedness plan. We received a little over $220,000 for surveillance to build up that basic infrastructure so that not only can we detect salmonella or measles, but God forbid we also would be able to detect anthrax or other agents. A another quarter of a million dollars to, to improve the lab to add some, some more rapid diagnostic tests in our laboratory, and then almost $400,000 for the health information network. We did not apply for enhancement of the laboratory along, chemical, uh, along the chemical route. Only four states were awarded, and there were other reference uh, sites more readily available than, than, than uh, it and would not have been practical for Alabama to undertake uh, that initiative. In closing, I simply want to point out that, in, that sometimes we are in many ways compelled to repeat history. This is a, a newspaper article dated August the 12th from Clearfield, Pennsylvania. And it reported that Falls Creek Tannery of Du Bois, Pennsylvania was closed due to, a anthrax, due to an anthrax epidemic. Four rather rapid deaths occurred among the employees who allegedly had bathed in the stream of water used by the tannery. The cows, who apparently had wandered in the same stream, likewise died. It was believed that hides from China were the vehicle for the visitation. And the New York Board of Health, up becoming concerned that the leather exchange of that city had received some of those hides, wanted to make sure that an investigation was carried out. And the plea from the, from the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1897 was, let us have a Department of Health. Well, Alabama formed its health department in 1875. Also, interestingly enough, driven by an outbreak, yellow fever in the Port of Mobile. But some things continue to go around. Here it was, we need a health department because of a potential threat. Now we're in the, in the system of saying, we've got health departments, but many of them have been underfunded. Many of the infrastructure for control of infectious diseases is not there. CDC funds will help provide the infrastructure necessary to, in fact, help us deal with the unlooked for visitations of bioterrorism. It's my privilege now to introduce the next speaker. I am reminded of that great public health speaker, Mark Twain. Mark Twain was once introducing Alexander Graham Bell near the turn of the century. And he was introducing Mr. Bell to a scientific audience and he said, Alexander Graham Bell and I know all there is to know about the telephone. He knows all that's known and I know the rest. In that same vein, Dr. Wernley and I know all that the health department knows about bioterrorism. He knows all that's known, and I know the rest. Dr. Wernley received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Franklin Marshall and Temple University, respective, respectively. Uh, he completed internal medicine residency at uh, Temple. He entered the EIS service from CDC, uh, spent two years in Mississippi. Uh, we were able to lure him over 
and in 1986 he became a state epidemiologist. Uh, in 1993 he was uh, named assistant state health officer for disease control. He serves as the principal investigator for the department on the bioterrorism initiative and is our principal contact in working with UAB on the preparedness plan. I'm pleased to give uh, you Dr. Charles Wernley. Thank you, Dr. Williamson. Good afternoon. Good to see everyone. And uh, I'm encouraged that postprandial uh, sleepies haven't hit you too hard yet. And uh, we'll try to get you through the rest of the afternoon. You've heard before that it's going to be difficult sometimes to determine if an outbreak was actually related to an act of bioterrorism. And CDC has categorized parameters of an overt or a covert event, an overt event being obviously one that was announced. And in that situation, recognition will be early, the response will be early, treatment of exposed persons will be able to commence early, and the first responders, your traditional first responders, will be the, the health care providers that are having the first encounters with victims. In contrast, in a covert or unannounced event, the recognition will be delayed, possibly uh, thus leading to a delay in treatment beyond the period at which it may be effective to abort infection. The response will be delayed, and our first line of healthcare professionals who will be engaged with the victims may likely be not first responders like, like EMTs and, and fire rescue, but emergency rooms and primary care providers. One of my concerns in, in the health department role that I have is trying to make sure that we maximize our capability to be able to evaluate an occurrence and make a judgment quickly on as to whether or not it represents a bioterrorism act. And I think there'll be some situations where that won't be very easy to do. Now you saw before this morning some of the characteristics that would help determine or help clarify that an outbreak is related to bioterrorism. For example, are the clinical presentations of an atypical character? Is there an inconsistent distribution of cases geographically? and or temporally? Is there a high or sustained number of cases? Is the causative agent unknown? Is the antibiotic resistance pattern an unusual pattern? And does the disease represent an influx of a non-endemic disease? And as Dr. Spiegel said this morning, you would not expect plague to occur in the southeast. And indeed, back in 1986, 1987, I moved to, through our rulemaking process at the state to have plague omitted, deleted, as a notifiable disease in Alabama because it had been 30 or 40 years since there had been an imported case, and why should we clutter up our list of notifiable diseases, which we expect all physicians to be able to cite by memory? How, why do we clutter up that list of diseases with non-endemic diseases? So plague was taken off the list back then. Well, try to uh, retain, re recall some of these characteristics as I walk you through two published case reports uh, that have been in the literature. And I ask you the question, as you read the abstract, does it sound like it might be intentional or that it was natural? Quote, an explosive common source outbreak of pneumonia caused by a previously unrecognized bacterium affected primarily persons attending a convention. 29 of 182 cases were fatal. Spread of the bacterium appeared to be airborne. The source of the bacterium was not found, but epidemiologic analysis suggested that exposure may have occurred in the lobby of the headquarters hotel or in the area immediately surrounding the hotel. Person to person spread seemed not to have occurred. Well, some of those characteristics, I think, today would make you think this could actually represent a release of a biological agent, a purposeful release with a nefarious intention. 
But this was a natural outbreak. This was the abstract in the New England Journal of Medicine of David Fraser and his colleagues writing up Legionnaire's disease description of an epidemic of pneumonia. And as you recall, that occurred in, I believe it was July of 1976 in Philadelphia. Well, another one, is this intentional or natural? A total of 751 persons had salmonella gastroenteritis associated with eating or working at area restaurants. The outbreak occurred in two waves, September 9 through 18 and September 19 through October 10. Epidemiologic studies implicated eating from salad bars as the major risk factor for infection. The investigation did not identify any water supply, food items, supplier or distributor common to all affected restaurants, nor were employees exposed to any single common source. This is a garden variety, quote unquote, gastroenteritis outbreak, or is it? Well, the answer was that this turned out to be an intentional outbreak. Tom Tork at CDC did the investigation. It was published in JAMA in 1997, a large community outbreak of salmonellosis caused by intentional contamination of restaurant salad bars, which occurred in the city of the Dallas in Oregon. However, if you read the article in JAMA, you'll note that the authors were quite frank to report that the characteristic of intentionality escaped the epidemiologic investigators. And they cited these reasons for why it wasn't detected as an intentionally caused outbreak. There was no apparent motive. No one uh, raised their hand to claim responsibility. Police had reported and recognized no unusual behavior patterns. There were no known disgruntled employees. The epi curve was consistent with a sustained source outbreak and therefore was not unusual with regard to uh, its, its pattern. Employees had some antecedent illnesses and so it was plausible that employees may have been the inadvertent sources of contamination. There was at that point no recognized historical precedent. There were thought to be other previously encountered hypotheses that were more plausible and therefore they concluded that an, an occult source of of contamination was the most likely conclusion. Well, how did they ever find out that it was an intentional outbreak? After the investigation was concluded for different reasons, law enforcement searched the compound of the cult and stumbled across an open vial of commercial stock culture of Salmonella typhimurium. When they found that stock culture, then the light bulbs went off they analyzed the stock culture. They found that it was exactly identical to the outbreak strain. Then they started to interview some of the cultists, and then the cultists divulged that indeed there had been an intention to contaminate the salad bars uh, as a political device in order to try to affect an upcoming local election. They argued that if they could get their citizens of the community ill enough not to vote, they would be able to stuff the ballot boxes, so to speak, by having just the well people who were the cultists go to the polls. So it's not always easy to determine if an outbreak is related to bioterrorism. Well, let me go through in some further detail our ambitions with utilizing the money that CDC graciously awarded to us in these four focus areas through their request for proposal from last year. Under the focus group for preparedness planning and readiness assessment, which we're working hand in glove with our colleagues at UAB, Dr. Metz and Ms. Elizabeth Westfall, we are doing several things. We're first of all establishing a program advisory council. One of the challenges that I see in responding to bioterrorism is that the requirement to orchestrate and coordinate harmonize, if you will, actions with other agencies is probably greater for bioterrorism than it is for anything else that normally comes across our tables in public health. So by establishing this program advisory council, we hope that we bring to the table as many of the impacted agencies and organizations that we can identify 
that will help smooth that coordinated response. And again, as it was said last night and this morning, one of the benefits of bringing people together is that there's face-to-face -face and recognition and name recognition so that if something occurs and you call someone, you already have a pathway of communication established. The preparedness effort will try to document and assess existing resources in the state and then we hope to develop and implement a preparedness plan. And in part of that plan preparation, we are working with CDC and the Department of Justice through their designated coordinated agency here in Alabama, the Emergency Management Agency, to conduct a comprehensive assessment of the situation throughout the state of Alabama, and that, situa that assessment instrument will utilize the Department of Justice generated survey. Well, who are some of the groups that we've invited to sit on the advisory council in Alabama? Certainly, we have a representative from the governor's office. We have folks from the Alabama Bureau of Investigation, the Department of Environmental Management, the Emergency Management Agency, the Department of Agriculture and Industries, the Ambulance Association, the Association for Practitioners of Infection Control, Birmingham Fire and Rescue, the State Broadcasters Association, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the FBI, Forensic Sciences, League of Municipalities, local health departments such as Birmingham or Jefferson County Department of Health and the Montgomery County Health Department, representatives from Maxwell Air Force Base, the State Medical Association, the Department of Mental Health and Mental Retardation, the Alabama National Guard, the State Nurses Association, the State Pharmacy Association, the Alabama State Press Associ Association, the Red Cross. We added the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery in part because of their expertise. Uh, they as an entity receive, unfortunately, uh, more than their fair share of terrorist threats and uh, may not only be a, a resource for uh, guidance, but also, uh, unfortunately, may be a target. University of Alabama Birmingham Coast Guard, uh, in large part because of their involvement with the Port of Mobile, uh, the Department of Justice, and the State Veterinary Medical Association. And I think you can all probably strike up a uh, a logic for why any one of those entities may have a role in either preparing for a bioterrorism event or responding to it. Under the surveillance and epidemiologic capacity activity, we hope to improve our ability to, de to detect rapidly an, an unusual outbreak, and part of our ability to do that will depend on enhancing our existing surveillance system. Improving surveillance, uh, as Dr. Spiegel said this morning, from something that can detect uh, an occurrence on a weeks to months basis to something that can detect occurrence on an hours to day basis is a formidable challenge. The historical paradigm for notifiable disease reporting is that the diagnostic, diagnosing facility, whether that be a primary care provider or a clinic or a laboratory, take the initiative to report the occurrence of the case into, reported into public health. And early on, if you check the laws, notify disease case reporting was to be done by the mail or to be done by telegraph. Uh, you'll see references in the law to the technology that was available at the time that these laws were first coined. And the laws haven't been upgraded, I think, beyond telephone, but certainly uh, these days one wonders how the internet technology may be utilized to increase the speed of case reporting. Regardless of the pathway whereby case reports would come into centralized depository for collation and analysis, a real concern I have is how we continue to stimulate the data entry in at the occurrence location. We can talk about equipping physicians' offices with internet. 
We can talk about equipping emergency rooms on the internet and so forth, but for that to be effective, an individual has to be authorized and then have the inclination to do the data entry. Whatever the pathway of data entry is, the data entry has to occur. And we know from our example in trying to establish a statewide immunization registry that doing bureaucratic data entry is not a high priority for routine clinic operations. The data entry that gets done is the data entry that leads to payment. But the data entry that leads to payment does not serve a timely function because there may be batch data entry for, for payment purposes. So I view that as a continuous challenge is to try to increase the likelihood that data entry will occur at the local clinic level, but in a way that's compatible with getting business done. Because obviously, we can't slow down routine clinic operations because every case now needs to be a large amount of information needs to be data entered. So that, that's a challenge for us to continue to work on. We obviously need to network with medical providers to improve our reporting of notifiable diseases. And then if we solve the, the riddle of how do we increase the stream of incoming data, we still have an obligation to, to perform timely analysis of those data. And the timely analysis is, again, a, a challenge that I think we have not had a lot of experience with in, in Alabama, partly because there maybe hasn't been an urgent need to have such timely analysis on routinely submitted no surveillance data. So our surveillance data may come in, and to be quite frank, the usual process that, that actually occurs is that our nurse epidemiologist who collects this information and who is in charged with streaming it so that it gets data entered, it's her synthesis of the incoming information which actually acts as the computer scanner to see if there is a perturbation in what's going on. That is, the scanning does not occur by a software application program that continuously runs analyses of trends. The scanning occurs by her sitting down and saying, this is the X1 that's come in in the last several days, there's something going on. It's a human element of analysis. And if we increase the influx of data coming into the health department by whatever technological advance that we can, we're going to have to increase our capacity to respond to those, in, to those incoming data. Now, through this grant, we've been able to hire two epidemiologists and a support person, and at least that's a start to get us moving in the right direction. Another major challenge that I see that the health department has some role is in working with medical providers to help ferret out the clinical nuances of bioterrorism. We need to increase the index of suspicion about the occurrence of diseases that we think historically shouldn't happen and which indeed have not happened for a long time. And that leads to almost a paradigm shift in what many of, many of us physicians were taught in terms of how to work through a differential diagnosis. Rare diagnoses occur rarely. Common diagnoses occur commonly. And therefore, you, the adage was always spoken that if you hear hoofbeats, it's probably a horse and not likely a zebra. But with regard to these agents of bioterrorism, it's the zebra diagnoses which are the ones that need to be immediately identified. So we need to encourage clinicians to not dismiss the zebras, but to think zebras as well as think horses for clinical presentations. We have a saying in our TB control program that's been preached to clinicians, think TB, and that's because it's a relatively common diagnosis which unfortunately does not enter the differential diagnosis early enough for many sick folks and their diagnosis of tuberculosis is delayed. Well, do we need to morph, to quote my children, morph think TB to think BT for think bioterrorism so that we have a higher index of suspicion for some of these diagnoses. I talked earlier about 
challenge of increasing case reporting to the health department and reaching out to physicians and infection control practitioners and labs. And then we have the challenge of increasing the availability of good diagnostic services at the health department laboratories as well as other laboratories, increasing the turnaround time for assessing specimens. And then we obviously need to increase treatment options. Now with regard to diagnostic challenges, these chest x-rays come courtesy of CDC and both represent diseases that uh, are cited as examples of agents that can be used in bioterrorism. But remember, anytime a clinician orders a chest x-ray, he gets back a picture of shadows like this. They don't come with a name on them. And there's a long differential diagnosis for, for any one chest x-ray. And as I said earlier, we're going to be asking clinicians now to think of unusual diagnoses. So actually, this chest x-ray is an example of inhalational anthrax. And you've heard before that it's acquired by inhaling spores. And appropriately, the FBI has felt that several cases of inhalational anthrax would imply bioterrorism until proven otherwise. A variable incubation period with pretty nonspecific symptoms early on, but then erupting into terminal symptoms of high severity. And at that point, and under the terminal symptoms, there may be the so-called pathognomonic, nearly pathognomonic x-ray of a widened mediastinum, which is due to the hemorrhagic mediastinitis, which anthrax causes. But even then, there's a differential diagnosis. And uh, that chest x-ray is, is cited uh, on the CDC slide as being consistent with certain forms of community-acquired pneumonia, pneumonic tularemia or pneumonic plague, Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, various forms of bacterial fungal or TB mediastinitis, certainly mediastinal tumors, and a dissecting aortic aneurysm are all in that differential. Now, this other chest x-ray was uh, cited as an example of tularemic uh, pneumonia. And uh, the difference there with the previous x-ray is that you have infiltrates in the, in the right lung field, which you didn't have in, in the other. And uh, the, the mediastinum is uh, arguably not, not widened. But uh, the, the point of these slides is that we need to be engaged in a process that helps alert clinicians that there are subtle clinical clues, subtle differential diagnoses here that they need to think about and perhaps uh, had not been working with on a routine basis. Another major challenge is what to do with the exposed. And I came up with an example for anthrax. The listed regimens for post-exposure treatment for anthrax include starting uh, one of several oral antibiotics within 24 hours after exposure. Well, we may be very challenged to learn that an exposure of bona fide confirmed anthrax actually occurs within 24 hours. That is, that window of time may be lost before the, the uh, treatment could be started in the, in the prime window of opportunity. Several of the ofloxacin, uh, of the uh, fluoroquinolones, excuse me, are recommended for post-exposure therapy, uh, doxycycline as well, and amoxicillin. And note that most of those are not highly recommended for children. Uh, ciprofloxacin is permitted for children in this situation, but it's not routinely recommended. And levofloxacin and ofloxacin are not to be used for children. Doxycycline is not to be used, uh, it's not recommended for children under age nine because of the possibility of permanent staining of the teeth. So uh, we, we have a list of antibiotics that are advocated for post-exposure therapy where ideally you wouldn't like to use them for children if you could avoid it. But obviously if you had a bona fide exposure situation, uh, you would err on the side of treatment. Note that the antibiotics are to be used for 60 days post-exposure if persons had not been previously vaccinated, been vaccinated with anthrax vaccine. And for those persons previously vaccinated with anthrax vaccine, uh, the antibiotics are still re recommended for 30 days. 
That is a lot of medicine. Let's pretend that we had a flyby release in a football stadium where we had 50,000 spectators. And so 50,000 persons arguably were legitimately exposed to anthrax spores. If you take the ciprofloxacin dose, 500 milligrams twice a day, and you multiply that times 60 days and use the public health service price at $1.45 per tablet, you do the arithmetic, it works out, you would need 6 million tablets to provide 60 days of therapy to those 50,000 persons. That's 3,000 kilograms of drug, and it would cost at that public health service price $8.7 million. And I would be surprised if more than 50,000 people said they were in the stadium that day. Now, thank goodness, CDC is working and developing the National Pharmaceutical Stockpile Program, so we in Alabama do not feel obliged to set up warehouses where we have $8 million, $9 million worth of ciprofloxacin sitting on the shelves. Uh, and we're very grateful that federal government is, is going to take leadership in that. But I throw it up here as an example of one of the challenges uh, that we face when trying to be civilly prepared for an act of bioterrorism. And the, the issue about who is exposed and who will justifiably deserve treatment is a very, very thorny issue. And I do not believe that we have a good handle on how to make those decisions yet. There will likely be very hard decisions to make about rationing drugs in certain bona fide exposure scenarios. And who determines who gets the drug, who doesn't get the drug, and how that determination is enforced and who chooses to be the enforcer of those determinations is, is, is a situation I hope we don't encounter. We, we've had a, a, an example recently in a southern city where hepatitis A was publicly attributed to a food handler in a, in a local restaurant. We knew the dates that the food handler worked. We knew the shifts that the food handler worked. We knew the location of the franchise restaurant where the food handler worked. We knew the incubation periods of time, so we could specifically identify the risk meal times that the public needed to know about, and those then were encouraged to come to the health department uh, and receive immunoglobulin as a preventative from, for hepatitis A. That message didn't play to the community. Anyone who in the last year ate a hamburger at the franchise somewhere in that town felt that they would benefit from the, pro, from the immune globulin. And it's, it's very difficult to validate that someone was or wasn't a patron at a restaurant on a certain day. And how would you validate whether someone went to the basketball game in last night's scenario or went to this football stadium where anthrax was released? You have to take their word for it, but then that immediately leads to the possibility that we are requested to prophylax more people than we can. Under our laboratory capacity enhancing project, we hope to increase our ability to detect Bacillus anthracis, Yersinia pestis, Francisella tularensis, Bacillus species, and Clostridium botulinum. We will upgrade to a biosafety level three uh, facility. We are in the process of placing orders to acquire two important pieces of equipment, ability to perform polymerase chain reaction readings and to acquire a pulsed field gel electrophoresis machine. And with the acquisition of those, uh, we hope that we will be able to increase the turnaround time, uh, improve the turnaround time for detecting those agents, and we've already hired an experienced molecular biologist. We are tasked to try to set up a referral network, and as you see in the next slide, CDC has proposed a four-level scheme for that. 
we need to train providers in procedures for how to package specimens that we are now going to be asking them to route through this laboratory scheme. We need to train the laboratory providers to know which specimens they should refer as opposed to ones that they can work on themselves, so to speak, and whom to call. We need to enhance their capacity to achieve rapid diagnosis, and we need to do this at the whole time that we are potentially supporting a crime investigation. And historically, chain of custody procedures have not been routine in public health laboratory operations. As a matter of fact, we have more or less taken a policy of trying to avoid that business because it uh, bogs down the routine business. And so uh, we sometimes respectfully decline to accept a specimen that might be coming from uh, uh, a civics claims case or something like that because it just uh, is not something that we feel we, we need to get involved in. But certainly here, uh, we don't have that luxury and, and we wouldn't want to, but the, the point is that we need to put an overlay of different procedures in for chain of custody from what is normally not there. As you saw in an earlier slide, there's the four-tiered laboratory response network advocated by CDC and our Bureau of Clinical Laboratories facility in Montgomery at the Health Department uh, will qualify for a level C uh, lab, lab that we are upgrading, as I said, to biosafety level three precautions. And by acquisition of our PCR and PFGE technology, we should be able to achieve rapid identification for many of these agents and either rule them in or refer on to CDC. I put this picture in just to illustrate how complicated routine specimen handling might be for, for referring a specimen from one lab to another lab, a double container, maybe it's even arguably tripled container, you have absorbent packing material. Uh, it's, it's a big deal to do it right, and it needs to be done right, and actually needs to be done right even absent concern about an uh, agent of uh, potential uh, bioweapons type agent. But if this is going to occur more commonly, uh, obvious practical consideration is that the laboratories need to have the equipment to package specimens appropriately, and although primary uh, first responders would not be packaging uh, pure cultures, which is what this picture shows, they still also need to be informed about how to handle a specimen that may need to be taken from a, a location where there was a release and put into appropriate uh, packaging material to be forwarded to a lab. So that uh, in the example given this morning, uh, if the, the chlorine was not poured on the, the culture, but the culture was picked up and packaged by the EMTs that responded. Obviously, they need to be educated and given the right tools to send it appropriately. Our health alert network and training uh, has ambitions of trying to train healthcare workers to uh, disseminate advice rapidly to the media and the public. We want to support the exchange of key information uh, among all parties and to uh, improve our organizational capacity to respond. We are upgrading our telecommunication systems. We've uh, been able to uh, start negotiations to get wide broadband uh, internet access to our public health areas and our county health departments. We have acquired some uh, push fax capabilities so that we can put out document quality uh, faxes uh, to a large number of receivers in a brief period of time. We're exploring with how we may trigger through the emergency management agency, the radio alert network that you usually hear for tornadoes and, and weather events. And we've begun to hire some staff there. With regard to outreaching the first responders, some of the challenges that we need to address with them are threat recognition and then threat containment what their personal protection uh, options are, how to handle specimens, and knowing whom to call. And I put just two of several different possible notification schemes on that we've been working on 
uh, as we try to develop our response plan in the health department. So in, in the first scenario, if we have a, a known mass outbreak, it, it's not going to be very subtle. It's obviously a, a large scale event and we would anticipate that there probably would be almost simultaneous notice going from the location where the large event occurred directly into the FBI, the CDC, and most likely to our state epidemiologist within the health department. And then there would be redundant cross-reporting at that next layer between state epi and FBI and CDC uh, to make sure that all three were informed and the state health officer would certainly be involved early, either through direct contact via the state epidemiologist or possibly the FBI. We show a health duty or health department on duty officer as an alternative pathway that an event could be called in. And I'll show you in the last slide that we have 24 hour access there. Then the state health officer would likely convene uh, his defined assessment team uh, and that would recommend whether or not a response team needs to be mobilized. Off uh, to the right is the media and we've heard talk before about how do we make sure that the media is given appropriate, timely information and serves as an ally to getting the right information to the public, but at the same time that there is some control, if you will, in terms of getting the business done that the media, in its understandable ambition to learn as much as it can, whenever it can, is not intrusive in, in doing that. And then the, the other example that I chose to show is if we have a called in threat, the, the hoax type of scenario, that will likely be called in to the local police department or the local fire department and they'll be the first to know about it and the first to respond. It may then be they who in turn notify the FBI that there is a, an alleged terrorist event. They may also well contact the emergency management agency and they may contact by our training of them, contact the health department's on-duty officer, and then through EMA or the on-duty officer, the state epidemiologist uh, would be notified, and that would then trigger the notification within the health department of the state health officer and so forth. And then, depending on the situation, state health officer might contact CDC. So these are just two possible examples of, of different ways that the notification scheme might unfold. So you're left with who you're going to call. And uh, we have two primary numbers with at the state health department level. If it's uh, normal business hours, the 800 number, the toll free number goes directly to the office of the state epidemiologist. It's in that office uh, where we also have our counterterrorism coordinator. State epidemiologist is Dr. J.P. Lofgren and Dr. Neil Sass is the counterterrorism coordinator and their local office numbers are listed there. If it's off hours, we would recommend that the call go into a 24-hour manned line, which is line, uh, manned by the uh, state troopers, the Department of Public Safety. They have a, a call switchboard. They know that if a call comes in re relevant to a possible bioterrorism type event or an outbreak event, that they know who to call within the health department and we have a system of getting them off hours. And two other very important uh, names and phone numbers for the health department are Dr. Cowan, who's in charge of our laboratory system, and Dr. Williamson, our state health officer. That concludes my comments and I appreciate your time and attention and I guess we might have time for questions if there are any. <laughs>